Previously in the complete creation. The slabs are each carrying both a dinosaur and human footprint in situ in the slab itself. again thank you for joining me on this epic adventure part 30 making our way through the files and of course as with all of my estimates and construction and renovations it's all taking way longer than i originally thought <laughs> for the past five segments we've been specifically looking at details of the fossil human footprints found among dinosaur tracks from the paluxy river in glen rose texas now, for the sake of brevity, I have left out volumes of data and information. I haven't shown CT scans from any of the other loose slab tracks or fascinating details seen in the CT scans that you know, indicate locomotion and unexpected density variations that were consistent among fossil tracks. I really haven't even touched on the park ledge in Dinosaur Valley State Park, which if you are accessing the video on demand version of this series, you can find a downloadable booklet with a map and details of the park ledge and where to go looking for fossil human footprints and potential fossil human footprints just on the park ledge in the state park. The series will be hosted on the server for my online courses. Head on over to members.jetpackacademy.com and you can find the Complete Creation series and this booklet with this lecture, Part 30. If you order the DVD or Blu-ray series, uh, you will also have access to the video on demand, so you will have access to this booklet. I'll also be providing links through the completecreation.org website. I would also like to point out that a lot of the evidence I've shared here was published almost 30 years ago in the book Texas Tracks and Artifacts. But one needs to understand the significance of this book compiled by Robert Helfenstein and Jerry Roth. Throughout the 80s, the debate over the Paluxy fossil human footprints was raging. Several creationists withdrew their support for the human footprint interpretation, the film Footprints in Stone, was withdrawn from circulation, and there was copious claims and counterclaims by both supporters and detractors. The Bible Science Association of Idaho was a large creationary association publishing a very popular newsletter. They put together a multidisciplinary task force to investigate the Paluxy tracks thoroughly, that the association may draw its own conclusions and successfully address both the supporters and detractors. The task force was composed of engineers, chemists, geologists, and paleontologists. For example, Australian geologist John Mackay was sent down to the Paluxy on a mission from God and the Bible Science Association task force. He was given a rack of chemicals, handpicked by the chemists in the task force, to go and apply to the Paluxy limestone in various places in the river, specifically to study those red and green stains that would appear and disappear. The task force also sent multiple people over the years of 1986 to 1993 to both interview proponents and detractors and investigate the in situ evidence firsthand. Some of the task force even participated in first-hand excavations. This was a massive undertaking, and Helfenstein and Roth compiled the results of those investigations as well as their own investigations into their book. So in these lectures, I have added some of my own research as well as more recent discoveries by other old-time investigators, but this was a monumental report, uh, report compiled from a monumental study conducted by a very large and prominent creation science group. Now in its revised edition by Robert Helfenstein's son, you can get the updated print version from the Colby Center or the Kindle Reader version, 
and you need to get a copy for yourself. But in spite of the overwhelming evidence, those who do not want to believe will not believe. There is none so blind as those who will not see. And when confronted with the overwhelming evidence, some diehard adherents to the religion of evolutionism have actually suggested in print that rather than being human footprints, these are actually the footprints of aliens who came to visit Earth during the time of the dinosaurs. Or perhaps it is evidence of time travelers going back in time to see the dinosaurs. My response to both suggestions is that A, that is a suggestion that requires more blind faith than I am willing to give. And B, did these alien creatures with obviously very sophisticated technology that enabled them to travel the cosmos to planet Earth, did they, you know, forget to bring their space boots? If they were the footprints of time travelers, why are the majority of footprints made by barefoot humans? Where's the Nike logo or the logo of whatever shoe manufacturers from the future that this time traveler left? Or was their time machine like the one in the movie Terminator where you could only go through the time portal naked? Come now, let us reason together. Does it not make far more sense and is far more believable that these are simply human beings who coexisted with dinosaurs and the reason they were running around barefoot is because the animals and the humans had already had to go swimming a few times because there was a global flood encroaching upon the land, higher and higher every day. If you have to go swimming, one of the first things you lose or take off is your shoes. And these people and animals were simply wandering around in between the tidal waves on freshly laid tidal flats, foraging for food, trying to get to higher ground to escape the next tidal wave, etc. Also, as we learned in the UFOs, Aliens, and Genesis miniseries, there is Zippo evidence for aliens, and I would dare say no evidence for time travelers either. But the Paluxy is certainly not the only place we find fossil human footprints. Back in 2005, Stan Lutz and I were training in fossil preparation and casting from the best of the best. Joe Taylor and the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum in Crosbyton, Texas, which, by the way, Joe and a small team frantically worked in the Texas heat to mold the entire Taylor Trail in 1999. You can go and see a cast of the trail in the Mount Blanco Museum, and you should plan to go there. Well, Joe had been commissioned by the town of Stinnett, Texas, to prep out a fossil bison skeleton that had been unearthed when the town dug a swimming pool. They had Joe make a display for the town office, and Joe sent Stan and I on a mission from God and the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum to deliver to the town office some more of the fossil casts. When Stan and I had arrived, we were floored to see this footprint in stone in a glass display case in the town office. And I just have to say that it pleased me greatly to be able to shock Dr. Carl Baugh with a fossil footprint he knew nothing about from his former hometown. We named the track AM Coffee. No, that is not a play on words. That's the initials and the name of the gentleman who discovered a trail of nine human fossil footprints on a rock ledge about four miles out of town. Mr. Coffee was an oil field worker and as such wound up wandering the West Texas Plains performing his duties on the oil pumpers and lines. He found the trail of footprints in 1934 and showing this track to friends and family, relatives and residents of the town, various interested persons took the rest of the tracks from the site one by one. After investigation, we learned of the area where the trail was found and put together a team to go explore the region to see if we could pinpoint the rock ledge. Now, 70 years had passed by this time, so this was no small challenge. The team included a geologist, and he and I both agreed that the rocks in question matched exactly the coffee footprint slab. In fact, take a close look. There is a thin veneer 
of harder rock on the top, which covers the entire surface of the rock, except here where it flaked off. And you can see the track underneath the crust. The mud, including this thin layer of slightly different composition, was all compressed by the foot. Now, if the track was carved, the carver would have cut through that thin veneer, but it's intact. Notice also that the rocks in the area was the, where the trail was found are a perfect match, complete with that thin veneer of harder rock on the surface. Now that rock is Permian. So on the evolutionary column, it is before the time of the dinosaurs. So according to the evolution column, man appeared in the rock record before the dinosaurs. In 2009, just as I was wrapping up a U.S. tour with my Creation Museum, David Willis contacted me. Now, I was at the Akron Fossils and Science Center in Ohio, and David asked me if I had time and wanted to go down to Berea, Kentucky, to investigate the Berea fossil human footprints. I had a few days to spare, as I was just going home anyway, so we made arrangements to meet up and went down to Berea College. Dr. Wilbur G. Burroughs, a professor at the college, had wound up studying these alleged fossil footprints extensively throughout the 30s. Dr. Burroughs was a PhD in geology and his wife held a bachelor's in geology. There were no dummies and were both of evolutionary persuasion. Now, I had looked into the Berea fossil footprints many years prior to this time. I, like untold numbers before me, who had heard of the Berea fossil fo human footprints, had simply read the 1940 Scientific American article by Albert G. Ingalls, writing about the tracks. This was the source of that now infamous quote that so many creationists cite about how if they are fossil human footprints and carboniferous rocks, that the whole science of geology is so wrong that geologists will quit their jobs and take up truck driving. He starts off the article with a nice condescending remark. Prints roughly resembling human footprints and found in very ancient rocks would greatly add to man's antiquity. Ah, oh, if only they were human. He then has a banner of images across the top of the article, and like so many untold numbers of people, I took one look at the images and wrote off the Berea fossil human footprints as simply Indian carvings, petroglyphs. Everyone would agree that is exactly what is in those images. Nevertheless, I personally think it is important to chase down all evidence and examine it firsthand, if at all possible. And a case study of obviously Indian petroglyphs in footprint shape is still valuable to the study of alleged fossil human footprints, right? So David and I ventured down to Berea, where David orchestrated an appointment with the Berea College Archives. And we went through boxes and boxes of correspondence, field notes, photos, pencil rubbings, and drawings from Dr. Burroughs. I have to admit, very quickly, everything turned out to be something I did not expect. There was a small geology museum at the college actually named after Dr. Burroughs. A kind professor there at the college welcomed us into the museum so we could look at original wax casts of the alleged fossil human footprints from Berea. This is one of those casts. Frankly, my jaw hit the floor when I first saw this cast. Two things were immediately evident. One, there was a very prominent expulsion rim surrounding the track strongly indicating that it was indeed an actual fossil footprint. Two, it would seem Mr. Ingalls, writing about these tracks in Scientific American, was practicing fake news 80 years before Trump ever coined the phrase. These were most certainly not the tracks in the photos Ingalls provided in his article. As a matter of fact, if you closely read Ingalls' article, you notice he very subtly admits that these are not the Berea fossil footprints that the entire article is writing about. I can only describe this entire article as carefully crafted deceit on the part of Ingalls and Scientific American. Deceit that went unchecked for 70 years until David Willis and I stumbled upon the truth. 
In fact, in the Berea archives, you can even see notes from Professor Burroughs expressing his extreme frustration with this belligerent fake news. Neither Ingalls nor any of his sources had examined the actual fossil tracks in question and in fact did not even visit the Indian petroglyphs he depicted in his own article. And Professor Burroughs obviously knew about and had studied the petroglyphs shown in the photographs. Just look at his note. Did not visit these tracks. So in the museum, we got to see wax cast after wax cast of multiple tracks which all had the hallmarks of genuine fossil footprints. Look at this pair. The expulsion rim is present, showing the squished mud. And remember, these were the tracks that Dr. Burroughs had examined by, had uh, an artist examine, who literally counted sand grains in the surrounding rock and inside the tracks that artist noted that the sand grains were more densely packed within the track than the surrounding rock. Now, it's true the tracks can have an unusual shape to them. Uh, for this one, the toes are unusually straight across the front, but there are some people watching this video right now with feet exactly like this. People who habitually run barefoot will notice that their feet will take on this exact shape. There is nothing inhuman about these tracks. And it's not like there was only one or two tracks. Here's the actual site. Every one of those holes is where there was a track that has been cut out of the rock. Now it's unfortunate because all the original tracks have been removed, but I saw every indication that these were genuine fossil footprints. In fact, you can see the struggle that Professor Burroughs had in his personal correspondence. He was of evolutionary persuasion. And so in his mind, these couldn't possibly be human footprints. So he called them human-like, but adamantly stated they were genuine fossil footprints. So why would Ingalls write an article with what can only be described as carefully crafted deceit. It's because evidence of humans in Carboniferous sandstones flew in the face of his prevailing religion of evolutionism. In 1977, a Japanese fishing trawler was drag netting off the coast of New Zealand near Christchurch. With their nets some 300 meters deep, they snagged the 10 meter long carcass of a strange creature weighing in at about two tons. The creature sure looked like a plesiosaurus. The carcass reeked a horrid smell of rotting flesh, was dripping liquid fat onto the deck. They didn't have the foggiest clue what this creature was, and here they were thousands of miles from home. They didn't want it spoiling their catch, their livelihood. So the section chief, Mishihiko Yano, took photographs, a few samples, of some strange fibers from one of the flippers, noted multiple observations, and drew some sketches. They then threw the carcass back into the ocean. When they got back to Japan, the photographs were developed and drawings were handed over to several researchers. Dr. Fujio Yasuda, who was a professor of ichthyology, the study of fish, at Tokyo University, and Professor Yasinora in my zoom eye, oh boy, I hope I said that right, who is the Director General of Animal Research at the National Science Museum. After seeing the photographs and drawings and hearing the testimonies of Yano and the other shipmates, in my zoom eye remarked that it's a reptile and the sketch looks very like a plesiosaurus. He further remarked that the evidence seemed to show that these animals are not extinct after all. It's impossible for only one to have survived. There must be a group. A commemorative stamp was issued celebrating the discovery in 1977. Everyone was in agreement concerning this astonishing find, yet the following year a mysterious thing happened. A team of French scientists became involved and a symposium was assembled that concluded it was merely the corpse of a dead basking shark. Let us pause for a moment to evaluate the situation in 1977. These people were experts in their field. First of all, the entire ship was a fishing trawler. These people spent their life on the ocean. 
Do you not think they would know a dead basking shark when they saw one? Their testimonies confirmed one another specifically and refuted a dead basking shark interpretation right out of the chute. Mishihiko Yano, the section chief who took the photos, was actually a trained marine biologist. In fact, his education outranked many of the people on the 1978 symposium, and they acknowledged this fact. Do you not think Yano would have known a dead basking shark when he saw one? Professor Imaizumai was the Director General of Animal Research at the National Science Museum. Do you not think he would have known a dead basking shark when he saw one? What followed out of the symposium was suspicious and, frankly, stifled further scientific research, but certainly stopped questioning of evolutionism caused by the find. The symposium did not take testimony from Yano, a trained marine biologist who had more education on the topic than many of they, them and had examined the corpse firsthand. The panel publicized their bizarre conclusion that was loaded with contradictions. I, for one, would like to go back over there with a submarine robot, as the oceans are still the most unexplored place on planet Earth. And Imaizumai was right. It's impossible for only one to have survived. Malcolm Bowden, publishing his analysis 22 years ago, solidly refuted the basking shark hypothesis, which anti-creationists latched onto and heavily promoted. But Bowden was also careful to say it was a plesiosaur-like creature. There was differences between the corpse and anything we know from the fossil record, even though our knowledge from the fossil record is certainly incomplete. Let's analyze this. Whenever Jaws showed up in the movie, Aside from the music, how did you know Jaws had arrived? Dun 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 The dorsal fin. Hey, where's the dorsal fin? Take a look at the photos yourself. Where's the dorsal fin? All of the experienced fishermen on the boat described the exact same thing. It reeked of rotting flesh and was dripping fat off the corpse. Sharks give off ammonia when they decay, not the smell of rotting flesh, and sharks do not have fat under their skin. Two more strikes against the basking shark. Look at the red flesh. Basking sharks do not have red flesh. Strike four. The corpse was dredged up from 900 feet below the surface. When they die, basking sharks float. Mammals sink. Strike five. The creature had four large diamond-shaped flippers in proportion matching the plesiosaurus and in direct contradiction to any kind of shark. Look at them yourself. Here you can see the two front flippers and the rear flippers are just off camera and almost the same size as the front ones. Strike six. The covering of strong dermal fibers, which is visible even in the photographs, is found in mammals, not sharks. Strike seven. The nares or nostril openings are on the front of the skull, not like sharks. Strike eight. The head was hard bone not cartilage like what is found in sharks. In fact, Bill Cooper pointed out another observation from the photos. Look at this cable right here. It's under strain and being pushed by the bony skeleton of the creature. The cartilaginous skeleton of a shark would flex and give way to the cable and not put it under tension. Strike nine. The fibers that were collected by Yano were analyzed and in some ways the amino acids matched those found deep in the fin of a shark, whereas in other ways the amino acids were very different. First of all, if it really is a basking shark, then the amino acids should be an exact match, not a close match and with several contradictions. Secondly, 
you have to have a living plesiosaur with which to compare. Thirdly, amino acid similarity is pretty meaningless. Rattlesnake heart amino acids called cytochrome C are nearly identical to the cytochrome C found in humans. So you can find matching amino acids in reptiles and humans. Any one of those strikes demonstrates that that is no basking shark. And here we have 10 strikes against. No, this was a plesiosaur-like creature that was still recently living. And you can read Malcolm Bowden's excellent analysis in his book, or you can read it online. The plesiosaurs are loosely considered marine dinosaurs, and the possibility that dinosaurs are not extinct is a fun topic for which there is surprising evidence. But if a living dinosaur were captured today, would that cause evolutionists to abandon their religion? Of course not. Just look what happened with the coelacanth. Its shocking discovery was likened to finding a triceratops grazing on the grass in your backyard. A living dinosaur would simply be met with comments of, isn't it amazing that they've survived all these hundreds of millions of years? I say that because that's exactly what they said in response to finding living coelacanths. But finding a living dinosaur might cause some to then accept the currently unacceptable evidence of originally preserved biomatter in dinosaur remains and dinosaur and human footprints found together. But Ian, wait! If you're suggesting dinosaurs are still alive, does that mean Noah would have brought some on the ark to survive the flood? How is that even possible? Hmm. Well, I'm out of time for this segment. I hope you'll join me again for the next lecture in this continuing journey. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. Even the very construction method of Noah's Ark alludes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.